Hello to everyone. Um, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening or morning or afternoon. It's really a pleasure um, to share this um, presentation with you. And I'm just going to start sharing my screen. My presentation this evening is called The Early Modern Memoir Buch, Memory, Charity, and Community. And I'm very, very pleased to be able to share it specifically um, at the National Library of Israel. And I'm very grateful to them for the invitation because what I'm going to present tonight is based on manuscripts that I worked with extensively at the library and also in the center in the central archives for the history of the Jewish people also in in uh, Jerusalem uh, part of the National Library and this is all part of the research um, which appeared in my recent book the patrons and their poor Jewish community and public charity in early modern Germany which just came out a few months ago and I'm really pleased to be able to share some of my findings with you specifically this evening about two Memor Bucher, the Memor Bucher of Frankfurt am Main and of the community of Worms, which are held by the National Library. So let's begin with a very basic question. What is a Memor Buch? A Memor Buch is a specific kind of volume that we find in almost every early modern community. So I'm thinking of communities in Europe from between about 1500 to 1800, although most of these records really extend well into the 19th and sometimes even into the 20th century. We have really over 150 such memorable from communities, large and small. And inside these volumes, before you see the uh, Frankfurt memorable, which I'll talk about extensively, um, we have names of the deceased of men and women, and they are inscribed in these volumes in exchange for gifts that they made or that were made on their behalf for the sake of their souls near their death. Now, this is a genre that is very, very commonplace and yet very, very understudied. And it's a really rich resource for studying Jewish history from a variety of different angles. And I'd like to share some of my um, findings from looking at the genre with you uh, during this talk. One of the characteristics uh, that is common to almost all the memorable that I have seen is that they contain a similar beginning. And this is what I would term both the genealogy and the history of Ashkenaz. These are pages from the Worms member book from the National Library Collection. And there are two different aspects which we really see copied from member book to member book. One is the list of martyrs. And there are lists of either individuals or communities, or sometimes both. Sometimes you have lists of specific individuals, specific rabbis, or just broader names of communities in which Jews were martyred during different kinds of persecutions, most notably the First Crusade, persecutions around the Black Death, later on, as we'll see this evening in the 1648 Cossack uprising, and also other persecutions as well that are perhaps less well known. This is a sort of generic list that's often copied from one memoir book to another. The other list that you might find in almost every memoir book is what I would call a list of notables from medieval Ashkenaz from the Middle Ages. And this includes notable rabbis such as Rashi or the Maharab Rotenberg, as well as notable donors who were inscribed in the medieval memoir book that we have, which I'll talk about a little bit later on in the presentation. People who donated charity to build synagogues in the main Jewish communities in Germany during the Middle Ages, what are known as Kihilot Shum, Speyer, Worms, and Mainz. And we have a list of these that are pretty set, fixed, and again, copied from volume to volume. And I think this is a very important and understudied aspect of the memory book or this sense that in these books, what is being inscribed is a long list of people who belong to the community and that the community had its roots in the Middle Ages, a shared heritage, if you will, which is being crafted by the inclusion of these lists of events and of donors, of notables, and of martyrs in almost every memoir book that I have seen. Now, if you turn the pages of the memoir book, the next thing that you'll usually come across, and I'll show you some of the different images as we go along, is what we might call a typical entry. And one of the things that I'll argue tonight is that entries change over time. But a typical sort of plain entry um, would read as follows. And I've brought examples from the Worms memoir book, from a different version, not the one held by the National Library, but one held in the Bodleian Library. These same entries can be found 
in the other memoir book, I'll talk about why communities have different memoir book in a few moments, but just to give you a sense of how it sounds. It's inscribed in Hebrew, but I'll be reading a translation. May God remember the soul of Marat Gilkin, but Rav Meir, together with the souls of Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, on account of her donation of 10 gold into the Hektish, this is the communal charity fund. As a reward for this, may her soul be enshrined for eternity in Eden with all the souls of the righteous women, amen. And then for a man, it might read, may God remember the soul of Rav Aharon Bar Moshe, together with the souls of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And again, on account of his donation for the Hektish, citing essentially the matriarchs and the patriarchs and putting the deceased person inscribed into the book in exchange for a donation, along with the matriarchs and the patriarchs and everyone else who is righteous. As we'll see, this can change, but this is the basic typical formula. Now, memoir books are really interesting documents, not only because of their contents, but because of how they were used. And the primary purpose of the memoir book, the apparent purpose was really a liturgical one. And if you see here in the image, again, taking from the Worms Memoir Book from the National Library, you see here an excerpt of a prayer that would have been uh, included in the Memoir Book and is in fact included in many, though not all of the volumes that I have looked at. And this is a blessing that is from the part of the prayer recited on Sabbath before the Musaf prayer, before the additional prayer. And it was at this point in the service that names of the deceased would have been read aloud. Now, how many names were read aloud? How was it done? This is something that unfortunately we have fewer records about and it's something that clearly changed over time. If you imagine a book that began in 1500, by 1750, you've got 250 years worth of names of deceased and it gets really long. So in Worms and Frankfurt, some of the sources that we have from inside the memoir book and also from Minhag books, from custom books, we see that something at least was read every Sabbath Although it's very doubtful to me that the entries in its in their entirety, as I just read them out to you, were read aloud because that would have taken a very, very long time. Perhaps just the names were read aloud, or perhaps certain names were read aloud. In Altona, for example, we know that one page was read every Sabbath. Again, we don't know if the entire page was read aloud or if just the names were read aloud, but we know that it was limited. And in Prague, this changes over time because the community complains that services are just too long and they can't have so many names read out loud and so some different ideas are suggested for shortening that and arranging the names to be read. Now it's also interesting as I noted that communities can have more than one memoir book and this is because in different quorums you would have the reading of the names and they needed a different copy to be kept in each synagogue because unlike other communal records which are typically stored inside a chest inside the room of the communal leaders and are kept guarded under lock and key, the memoir book, though very, very valuable, because of its liturgical function, was normally kept in the synagogue. And so if you have more than one synagogue, you need more than one book. And just to show you some examples, this is the copy of the Worms memoir book that we have from the National Library. And it was actually used in the Rashi Beit Midrash, which was a building constructed in the 17th century just uh, right next to proximate to the synagogue itself. And if you look at the title page, I'm not sure if the image is large enough for you to make it up. What it says is Sefer has karot mishamot, he in Sefer hazikonot hayeshan. This is the book of remembering the souls, which I described copied from the old memoir book, from the old book of souls. And this one was for use in the Rashi Beit Midrash and the scribe was hired to copy the main synagogue's volume, which is unfortunately lost to us. We have its contents, which were published by Abraham Berliner, but we no longer have the actual manuscript. And then he made a copy, and this is the manuscript held by the National Library. Actually, in the case of Worms, it's really interesting. We have a third memoir book that was probably copied or purchased by David Oppenheim, the famous rabbi who was chief rabbi of Prague in the 17th century and in the 18th century. And he had a massive and famous library and he collected many uh, objects from Worms precisely because he was born there and this seemed to him an important object. But just to give you a sense, the different volumes were copied for use in different synagogues. In the case of Frankfurt, we're lucky enough to have two different manuscripts held by the National Library. What you see here is the, the memoir book from the Hektesh synagogue. There was a quorum 
in the communal hospice. And it was, uh, it was only 213 folios, which maybe sounds like a lot. It is actually a beautiful and long manuscript, but it was much, much shorter than the main communal manuscript, which is 537 folios. You can see that the main communal manuscript covers more years from 1628 to 1907 instead of 1691 to 1852. But a very close comparison that I did of the two manuscripts shows that far more people were included in the main communal memorable than in the hectic memorable. And actually, it seems that most of the people who were included in the hectic memorable uh, were only those who prayed in that synagogue, whereas everybody wanted to be inscribed in the communal memorable. So it's very rare, and maybe I'll have time at the end to discuss this if someone's interested, um, to see people who are included in the smaller hectic memorable and who are not included in the larger communal memorable. Um, and this brings me to my next point, which is that while these books have a very important liturgical use, it is also very, very critical to this community. And by this community, I don't mean just Worms or Frankfurt, but to early modern Jews to be recorded and included in these volumes. The very act of writing down, of, inscri of inscription, of being put into that book and being included was an act of extreme cultural importance. And it speaks to something about the time period, which is the very important aspect that record keeping had at this time. This is a time in Europe in both, so among both Jewish and Christian communities in which record keeping is just vital. And we see this um, very clearly in various sources and especially in the world of the memorable. And just to give some examples of the importance of recording, this is taken again from the Worms memorable. There's a very fascinating moment in time where the scribe brings us into the scribal process. And he says, concerning this, every heart shall cry and every eye shall tear about the recent destruction in our days in the land of Poland and Ryzen, Ryzen is Ukraine. The rabbi Samson ben Samuel of blessed memory, this is Samson Bacharach, the rabbi of Worms in the, 16th, in the 17th century, excuse me, in a short, excellent version, the difficult events including which part and in which location, and concerning what specific topic the aforementioned destruction and troubles and travails, as he found and described in the book Sukha Itim. Sukha Itim is a famous book written about the Cossack uprising. And what this inscription is telling us is that the rabbi from Worms read what was written in Sukha Itim, the narrative of that persecution. And he, the rabbi, commanded us to memorialize them, meaning those who were killed in the uprising, along with martyrs of 1096, this is the first crusade. And this was done with the permission of the aforementioned holy community. So what exactly happens here? Well, one thing that's really interesting is that you have a bunch of refugees coming from the East, moving to Worms. Perhaps they bring the book with them, perhaps they bring their stories with them. And there's a debate, should we include in our communal memorable in our lists of martyrs that we've copied from previous communities, this current persecution, is this something that warrants inclusion in the memorable? And the rabbi, together with the communal leaders, decide that it is. And so it's written down and underneath this inscription is actually the signature of the scribe who says, I copied it down. And then because we have a copy from the Rashi Beit Midrash of the copy of the main synagogue, the second scribe said, and I copied it down too, and he signs his name. So everybody signs their name, everybody explains how things get included, and this very deliberate calculation of what goes into a memorable, and also, as we'll see at the end of my talk, what does not go into a memorable is really critical for understanding the genre. And it shows the importance, how, how critical it was culturally to be written down in this book how important it was to think about the actual words. Now, another example on the individual level, not the communal level, that really speaks to this question of inscription comes from the community of Frankfurt, which has a memorable that has a very fascinating history. We saw the volume, that large volume, it weighs actually at 28 pounds, um, which is really quite heavy. And as I said, it was stored in the synagogue. But in the year 1711, there was a huge fire that began in the rabbi's house that abutted the synagogue and destroyed the Frankfurt Judengasse, the ghetto, the one street in which the Jews were permitted to live in Frankfurt. And if you look at this image of the fire, you can see that here in this empty space where my mass is, that was the Judengasse and there was just nothing there. 
Among all the wooden houses that were destroyed in the synagogue that was destroyed, of course, the memorable also went up in flames. And this was something that really bothered the community. And what winds up happening is that in 1712, the charity collector of the community decides to commission a new memoir book. This is something that's really hard to do because you need the records and the records went up in flames. But he, as a charity collector, has access to communal records. And what he does, and this is written in the colophon of the Frankfurt memoir book that we have today in the library, he takes out the Pinkas, the log book of the burial society in which those who have departed this world over the past hundred years were recorded. And he commanded to copy the names of the holy souls, righteous men and women in the land, and to commemorate them at all times. And that which was not written down cannot be copied nor memorialized for they are lost to us. And what we learn is that he has access to other records. As I mentioned, this is a period of record keeping. And the burial society kept records, they're very meticulous records. I've gone through them and they're extremely interesting. I'll mention that again. Uh, towards the end of the talk. And they, they talk about where every deceased person was buried, where in the cemetery, next to whom, at what angle, where the heads were, where the feet were. But in many cases, the names of the deceased are included, full names. And so the charity collector hired someone to go through these records and reconstruct the memoir book to the best of his ability, aware, however, that he did lose some names and that he was not able to include them. And that's something that he writes down. Normally we might someone, expect someone to say, this is terrific, I found the records, I included everything I could. But he really acknowledges uh, the, the fact that he can't include everything, that there are things that have to be missing. There are names that he simply doesn't have. And this is not just because of the importance of inscription, but also it's tied to the liturgy. These are people who paid to have their names prayed for by the community and services. And so the loss of those names feels like somehow an abdication of, of the responsibility that the community has to pray for these people. So these are intertwined tasks. And it's fascinating to what lengths the Jews of Frankfurt went in order to include um, people in the memoir book. Just to show you, here's a page from the Frankfurt memoir book from the earlier years, the pre-fire, pre-1711, meaning the records that were reconstituted. And if you look here with me, you can see, even if you, you don't read Hebrew, you can see we have name, Yiskor, remember, God, God should remember, Yudle. God should remember, and it's blank. Why is it blank? Here's another blank. Here's another blank. Here's another blank. What's really interesting about these blank spaces is that these are the names of women. And if you look at the burial records, it will say, here was buried the daughter of so-and-so. Here was buried the wife of so-and-so. And so the woman's first name wasn't in the burial record. And so what the scribe did was leave a blank space for the woman's name and included the, 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 the uh, biographical information that was available. So here, if you can see, remember blank, we all don't have her name, the daughter of Rabbi Shmuel. Because in the burial records, that's how she would have been referred to. Whereas the memoir book would have had her first name. This, I think, shows how important it was to the community to try to record and, of course, to try to pray for every single individual that was supposed to be in this book, even if that individual's name had been lost due to fires or other lapses. And it's just really interesting to note, and this is something we'll see a bit later on, that the reason that the charity collector, that um, laser Eliezer Oppenheim, creates this memoir book is not just out of the sense of duty and not just out of the fact due to the fact that he has the money to pay for this and also feels responsibility feels um that he can do this because he has access to the records but because his wife from it died in the year 1712 she died in childbirth and so he wants her name to be inscribed in a memoir book and so all the entries prior to her entry are entries that are reconstituted from the old book, they're 1711 and earlier. Those in the years right before 1712 all have complete names because these would have been men and women who would have been known to living community members. But if you go back to the 1500s or to the early 1600s, these are names that could have been lost to time. Now, in order to really get into the genre and to understand why there are so many books and what these books meant to the communities in early modern Europe when they ha we have so many. I think it's useful to try to compare the memorable that we do have 
to the one memoir book that we have from the Middle Ages. And we only have one, one memoir book from the Middle Ages. We call it the Nuremberg Memoir Book. Um, we have a facsimile from the National Library. It covers the year 1296 to 1392. And you see a little example of it here, the title page, and also an excerpt of the text. Here, the excerpt from the text reads a bit differently from what I showed you before. It's actually just a list of names and a donation. So, for example, and I'll read in the Hebrew and translate, Reb Yitzchak bar Yosef, Chatzi Revia. So, Yitzchak, the son of Yosef, gave half of this coin. Yitzchak bar Kolonimus, Heniach Sferim Lekahal. He gave books to the community. Maratzim Chabat Rabbi Eliezer, Chatzi Licha Lelimun, the Chatzi Licha. So this woman gave X amount of money to those students who were studying and X amount to the cemetery. And I think you can already feel the difference and see where I'm going. There's no lengthy text. There's no references to matriarchs and patriarchs. It's really just a donation list. And the donations are different. It's not all money. And some of it, much of it, is earmarked towards specific causes. The cemetery, lighting in the synagogue, books. And different things. There's actually quite a lot of uh, references to a cemetery, which has had some scholars claim that the cemetery was a new institution and really, really needed funding, which is also really interesting to think about what gets funded and when. So this reads somewhat differently from all of the early, all of the early modern memoir Bukhar, and I'd like to tonight share three different, uh, three differences that I think really jump out that allow us to really understand the importance of the genre to early modern Jews living in Europe and also as historical sources. So the first such development that I'd like to talk about is the development of a set fee. In the entries that I just read to you from the Nuremberg Memoir Book, we saw different amounts to different causes. But what we see in early modern Memoir Book, and here I am talking specifically about Worms and Frankfurt, although much of what I'm saying is actually exactly the same in many different communities. My research since has taken me to look at many different memoir Bukhar, and I see some similarities and some differences. And to look at this, I'd like to go to a source um, that's very rich, and that is the custom books of the sexton of the Worms community at the time of the memoir book, Yuspa Shamash, who was the sexton in the 17th century. And what he explains to us in his custom book is the following. Again, he writes in Hebrew, and this is a translation. Every head of household that dies, whether male or female, must pay 11 gulden to the hektish. The hektish in Worms means the communal charitable fund. That's a general charity fund run by the community. Immediately after the 30-day mourning period, 10 gulden is for the burial plot and burial expenses. And burial expenses are, are very hefty. This is another really interesting topic. You have to pay for the boards to construct the coffin. You have to pay for the shroud. You have to pay a tax to the Christian authorities. There's an escort tax as well. There's a lot of, tax of, of, of expenses associated uh, with burial. And one golden is for recording him or her in the Pinkas Haskarat Nishamot. This is the memoir book. And to memorialize him or her for one year. And after that, they erase him from the memorial book. But if he is well to do and able, they coerce him to give another 10 golden. And this payment is paid off over the year from the day the deceased died. And immediately on the last Sabbath of the three-day mourning period, the sexton writes his name down in the book of eternal memory to be recited for one year. And after he has paid the 10 gulden, he remains inscribed there for eternity. And whoever does not pay off the 10 gulden, he is erased after one year from the book of eternal memory and is not memorialized other than during that first year. And the payment to the sexton for the inscription and all the above burden is a quarter gulden. So there's also a fee to pay here the sexton, sometimes a scribe, for the actual writing of the document. Now, what does this really mean? What Yusuf Shamas is suggesting is that there are two different manuscripts that are used in parallel. One manuscript is where you write down the people who died, who paid for their burials, and then paid one extra golden for the right to be inscribed and memorialized for the period of one year after death. Now, I just need to tell you, having gone through the records of the charity collectors and all the community uh, associates and all the officials, and I've gone through their log books and their finances, it's really hard for people to pay for this right away. You often see people 
using collateral, giving jewelry, giving items from the house and say, take this until I can pay off the burial debt. So this is not something that everyone can afford, but people slowly pay off these debts in reality. So the picture we're getting here is very idealized. On the ground, it doesn't really work like this. And then Yospa says that again, in this ideal reality, people will give another 10 gulden following that year, they'll pay it off over the course of the year, and then they'll be inscribed in the memorable, the one we have today the fancy, for eternity, memorable, where you're going to be included forever until they stop using these, these uh, books, sometimes really up until the Second World War. Now, I have to tell you, as someone who worked with these manuscripts, I haven't really seen many erasures or crossing out. I have seen that once or twice. I don't think they actually cross people out, although I have never seen a, a copy of this draft pin cast to compare. But having compared other communal records, burial records, and tombstones to these lists, I'm not really sure that they did actually erase people, and they sometimes included people who didn't pay the set fee. So again, what happens on the ground in a community is really different from this picture. And yet, I think this picture shows us something important. In the ideal world, everyone has to pay a set fee, and that set fee is 10 for burial, one for inscription, and then another 10 for inscription coming to 21 Gulden. And it all goes to the communal charity fund, which gives the charity collectors the most flexibility with how they can use these funds. So it's not earmarked towards the lighting or towards the cemetery. It's all in the hands of the charity collector, which is something very critical because the community has a lot of expenses and really not a lot of income. And that's something I'm happy to talk about also in the questions and answers. Just to show you that this is not just in Worms, Here's a page from the Frankfurt Memorable, and you can see Aleph Chaf Sofit written several times. That's the gematria of 21 gulden, which I would assume is the same 21 gulden. 10 for burial and then 11 for inscription. This is a price that we see across Memorable. Different communities may be somewhat different. Sometimes it just says giving something to the hectic, but we do see fewer and fewer earmarked donations over the course of the early modern period and more in the 15th century and the 16th century. And then these taper off and these become cash payments to the communal charity fund. So that's the first change, a set fee to a broad charity fund. The second change that we see over this period is actually that we have a family context. If you think back to what I showed you about the memoir book from the medieval period, we saw a list of names. We have absolutely no idea, no identifying information to know if there's any connections between the names. Are these chronologically inserted? Is there some relationship between the people? And this is something that we know much more about when we get to the early modern period. And the best example of this is of course from the community of Worms. And if you look with me at this page, you'll see something really fantastic. These are all the entries. And then you see things that are written in the margins. What is written in the margins? Identifying family information. And this is something that we see much more frequently as we get to the 17th and 18th century. So this is a close up of the page we just saw. So you can look along with me. This is just one example of what's written in the, in the margins. We have here Adel Bat Jacob Cohen, the, the second wife of David Alsace, who died in 1666. That's the marginal insert, second wife of David Alsace. The next entry, Sheva Bat Eliezer Lipman, his first wife, David Elsas's first wife, for whom there is no date of death. So we don't know if she died first and then he remarried or if they were divorced. I would assume if they were divorced, she would not be written as his wife. And so therefore she died after his second wife. The third entry is Sprintz, Elsas's daughter-in-law who dies in 1736. And then Elsas is listed a few lines later, he died in 1674. I hope that a few things are jumping out at you, and it's a lot of names and a lot of details, but there's something really important that happens here. First of all, this book is not chronological. It's roughly chronological, but there's no reason to assume and every reason not to assume that these names are listed in chronological order. And you have to do a lot of detective work to figure out who died when, because the dates are not always included. And so the way I've dated, um, these entries is by comparing them to burial records, to tombstones, to other data that we have in other communal log books and making a chart and trying to put some order to it. So they're not chronological. The second thing that we see is they're familial. We have here 
a family grouping, a second wife, a first wife. And this is really, I think, by design. And some of the reasons for that, I think, will, will come across shortly. But this is organized according to family units. And what's interesting is that means you have to leave spaces in the manuscript if you're the scribe. You have to say, okay, well, this wife died, he didn't die, he might want to be written near there, so I'll leave a space. This may explain also the whole draft book that we don't have a copy of, because if you have a draft, it's much easier to work off the draft and then make it look very beautiful than to really think about who might die when and who might need to be included. And so this is something very important to know when you're working with these sources. Um, in, in Frankfurt, we don't have any marginal notations um, post-1711. We don't have any pre either, but that's copied. That is chronological copied from the burial records. But by doing some detective work, I was able to see that a similar scheme uh, actually exists. And so just as one example where the blue arrow is, you have Hindala Matz who died in 1743. She's listed, followed by her husband who died several years earlier in 1738, followed by her son who predeceased them both in 1719, and then her daughter-in-law Mindel who died in 1763. I am going to talk in a few minutes about why this is important. It's not just genealogical trivia. It actually tells us something about the book and its meaning. So just bear with me as I show you some of the data and then explain why this is important. The first reason that this is important is because this is something that can convey family prestige. Let me show you one example. This is back to the Worms Memorbuch where we again have a sequence of a family inscribed. The first person who is inscribed here is Isaac Ginsburg, a very important community member who died in 1632. Following him is Shmuel ben Jacob, the great grandfather of number three. And number three is Shmuel Zanville, who is the father of number one. So how do we make sense of this? First, we have somebody and his father, one and three, and then in between, somebody inserted, somebody inserted a really a, a, a somewhat distant ancestor, a great, great grandfather of number three and the great grandfather of number two. Now, how did this happen? Why is this written in this order? Why are they waiting so many years to include this number two, Shmuel ben Jacob Halevi, in this memory book? And the scribe tells us, he makes a marginal notation to tell us this story. And he tells us, for more than 60 years, Shmuel ben Jacob was a Parnas, that's a communal leader and leader, and he blew the shofar here. And I will gossip and reveal a secret. The scribal secrets are always the most fun for historians. My father, Shmuel, the son of the Katzin Shimon Ginsburg, the son of his daughter's son, is the very one who volunteered to donate on behalf of the father of his father's mother that he would be commemorated for eternity. So this was a somewhat famous ancestor who was responsible for an important communal task, blowing the shofar. And Shmuel ben Jacob um, was not memorialized in the earlier memoir book. And so Shmuel Zanville, number three, decided he was going to pay extra money, an extra set of 10 golden to commemorate this important ancestor. And this scribe happens to be his son. And so he, tells the secret, my father put him in. And why put him in? Why put him in there? He said, when I die, put him in too. Put, put him in too. Or maybe Isaac, who was Shmuel's father said, okay, my father paid for that. Inscribe me there as well. Now, I, I want to sort of underscore, why do this? Why construct it in this way? Well, it goes back to the meaning of the memoir book that I said earlier, the liturgical use, and also the importance of record because this family prestige can be expressed in two ways, through writing, by grouping them all together, by saying, I'm paying to have everybody in here, but also, and going back to the liturgy, through sound, through sound, how this was sound in the synagogue. And I wanna come back to both of these points um, just through one more example. First, through writing. It's not just about being written, but sometimes it's about how things are written, how are the entries written. One of the things that's really interesting about Memorbucher when compared to other communal records is the uneven hands that we have. And if you look at this page, you'll see a very, very fancy ornate inscription with a big score heading it, taking up most of the page. And then 
a shorter, less formal, less fancy inscription, which was probably not written by a famous scribe. This one actually, the reason I chose this specific page is because the person who is being commemorated is one of the most famous scribes of the Frankfurt community. And so probably someone in his own family, like his son who took over the scribal profession would have written this inscription. So it's also about how you're inscribed. This is something that's much more common in the 18th century, the length of the inscription, the details that are given. You can see just from looking at this, and we're not going to read it together, that this entry is not at all like the typical entry that I read to you at the beginning of this talk. This is much lengthier. It has many more details. And here in the late 17th and 18th century, is where the details about individuals can be so rich for really going into a social history of the community and understanding who these people were and how they were remembered and what they did um, in terms of communal life. And we have details here that really I haven't found in any other sources. And this is really what makes the genre so very critical as a historical source and also very ornate, very beautiful. Um, the Frankfurt Memorial book ends with Baron, uh, Baron Rothschild and his page takes up the whole page, as you can imagine, and is really quite beautiful. So that's about the writing. By writing everyone down and grouping them together, the prestige of an individual and the prestige of a family could be preserved. But it's also in terms of sound. Because I keep saying, oh, I looked at this and I compared it to burial records and I did all kinds of things in order to try to reconstruct this. But you don't have to do that kind of detective work if you live in the 17th or 18th century. You know these people. They are your neighbors. They are your parents' friends. They are people that you have known for your entire life from the synagogue. And so one might consider the 17th and 18th century memorable to be an epitaph or a burial plot on a page. Think about like a virtual cemetery written down in a book with family members remembered in neighboring entries alongside one another. And when read aloud, and this is my main point about the hearing, this was an oral family plot that would have been recognized by those listening. They would hear even on a Sabbath where just the names are being read. These are names they would have known when you're reading names, of course, from a generation that you knew. But if it's grouped in family blocks and not chronologically and not by date of death, then these are clusters that would have been recognizable. And if you had a really prestigious family and you had a lot of very important ancestors and they were grouped together, you'd say, yeah, that's a very important family. That's right. So just to recap, so far we've seen two changes in the early modern period. First, a set fee. And second, this idea of putting this into a family context, organizing the book according to family and focusing on prestige. And this brings me to the final change that I'm going to be talking about tonight, and that is donation by heirs. This is something that I think is quite interesting and um, very difficult to see in the text without thinking very carefully about the language. If you think back to the Middle Ages memoir book that I started with, I read a name and an amount, a name and an amount. But it's different when you get to the early modern period because you have a name and then they say when they be enshrined with the matriarchs or with the patriarchs, depending if they were men or women, because of the donation that they made to the hectish. But as we go through time, as we go forward by decade, we can see that the language shifts just a little bit. And instead of saying for the 10 golden he or she gave to the hectish, it says for the 10 golden that the heirs gave to the Hectish, or that somebody's husband gave to the Hectish, or that her son gave to the Hectish. And so the actual transaction, the money, doesn't necessarily come from the deceased person, but comes from his or her heirs. Now, just to be clear, sometimes it comes from his or her estates, and I've looked at some wills and some court cases about wills, and that show me that sometimes the money comes from the estate. But this is part of the responsibility of the heirs. And that makes sense because if this is about family prestige and there is a set fee, then it's no longer an expression of an individual man or woman saying, you know what, when I die, I'd like to give five coins to the cemetery or to the lighting in the synagogue. But you need to be inscribed. Everyone knows what the amount is. It goes to the, the, general, the general charity fund. So this is something that's very clearly uh, laid out and delineated. And so it makes sense. So your heirs want you to be in there. It's part of their prestige as well. And what they do is pay that fee. And so what I tried to do was after working out the dates of the different entries in the Worms Memorable, 
really give a breakdown of, if you see the chart here, and for people who don't like charts, I'm gonna explain it also verbally, donated by others is in blue, donated by themselves is in orange, and yellows is family units, some family grouping donated together. This tapers off in the 16th century. This is much more like the medieval uh, memoir book where you see a couple donating for a specific item. And then you see gray is also couples. This is something that disappears over time. And you can see that with the exception of these years from 1690 to 1709, we see an upward trend where we go from almost all donations by the South to almost all donations by heirs. And the reason we see a change from 1690 to 1709 without getting into it too much is because in 1689, Worms is burned to the ground by the French troops. The entire community has to leave. Nobody lives in Worms. It takes 10 years to rebuild it. And so we have very, very few donations. And those donations are made by refugees who live elsewhere. And so it's very, very different. It's not their heirs when they die. They're actually sending mostly physical items to their community in the hopes it will be rebuilt. So it's a complete anomaly. Now, this chart gets all the more interesting when we think about Jewish law and how inheritance works. Because women are not technically heirs under Jewish law. There are many loopholes employed in the early modern period so that daughters inherit along with sons. But the, don the, the heirs in the member book are almost always male. And here I'll show you two different charts where I've broken them down by gender. The male entries, donation by self and others, the light green is men donating for themselves, and the dark green is men for whom others donated. And you can see it's the same trend moving much more towards heirs donations in the 18th century. But if you compare it to the bottom chart of the women's, where also the light color is women donating for themselves, and the darker color is women for whom others donate, you can see that the trend starts much sooner for women. It's much sooner that women are no longer the active donors, but rather they're donated for on behalf, they're, they're donated for by their male heirs, by their husbands and by their sons. And as we'll see in a moment, men are hardly ever, ever, ever memorialized by their wives because the wives are not the heirs. So just to give you a sense in, in words, not in charts, in Worms, only two men out of 430 men were donated for by their wives, which is less than 1% of the donations honoring men. By contrast, 210 women out of 425 were memorialized on account of the donation made by their husband, which constitutes 47% of the donations given to honor women. So it's a very different percentage. Women and men are commemorated but the record removes women from the position of active donors and incorporates them instead as parts of family units. And what do I mean by that? I wanna be very clear. Again, I've gone through many charity records and this is something I've done in my book. And we see that sometimes the women are the ones who pay, but they're never remembered as the people who pay. Their involvement is sort of obscured. It's, I don't wanna say erased, but it's obscured, whereas the men's involvement is not obscured. And it's the same in Frankfurt as well, just to give you a sense without charts this time, because you can't break that down easily uh, by decade the way you can in Worms. It's just a much bigger community, it require much more um, work to compare to the burial records and we don't have an extant cemetery. But in Frankfurt from 1648 to 1750, not even one woman donated on her own behalf. This is totally different from the Middle Ages when women donate on their own behalf all the time. Only one man out of 1,038 did so. So the practice in Frankfurt also clearly moved towards a system where one's heirs donated for him and her. They donate not for themselves, but for their heirs. And what winds up happening, and I really want to, to, to stress this, is that this really does obscure in many, many ways the active involvement of women in charity. And women are very active in charity, and yet, their records, their, their actions are part of the family unit. And this is something that we see, not just in the memorable, but in many different kinds of charities and charities to the Holy Land, in Christian charity of the time where female gifts are part of the family gift and male gifts can be individualized. And this is a general trend that we see in the 17th and 18th century where women's actions while still happening are sometimes really, really obscured by male record keepers and by male communal leaders 
who sometimes push them to the sides, which is a really interesting trend parallel among both Jews and Christians. Now, these sources are really wonderful and show us a lot about how charity was donated and how these books were conceptualized and how they changed over time to be more ornate and with more details and to really be something very important both liturgically and through the written record and the wonderful sources. But I'd like to also show you one other aspect of them, which is that part of this very conscious construction and deliberate inscription meant that not everyone was included and there were choices being made. I gave the example earlier of the question of the Cossack uprising and the deliberation forms ever whether that should be included in the text or not included in the text. And the same is true for various people. You might look at one of these memoir books or think of this 28 pound memoir book from Frankfurt and think, wow, there's a lot of people in here. Let's say I went through, um, I would say about 4,000 entries for a 250 year period. And you might think it includes everyone, but it does not. And the case of Frankfurt really allows us to dig deeper into who was part of the memorable and who was not part of the memorable. So just to give a little bit of a sense, we have, as I mentioned, the burial records of Frankfurt. And as you know, uh, the fire in Frankfurt in 1711 meant that the records from before 1711 are all taken from the burial records. And this affords the historian with a wonderful opportunity. You can sit down with the burial records in one hand, and you can sit down with the memoir book in the other hand, and you can compare them and see, okay, who did they put in and who did they decide to leave out? Now, I've done this up to 1680 for when we, that's the period for which we have burial records. And there were 3,545 burials performed in Frankfurt, but only 1,022 names in the memoir book of these 17 are buried elsewhere, but they're in the memoir book, they're buried in a different cemetery. So we won't count those. So there are 2,540 individuals who are buried in Frankfurt, but receive no mention in the memorial book. Who are they? Well, 1,510 are babies and young children. We don't know how old the children are. Ages are not really included on tombstones until the 18th century. There are 499 older children, both boys and girls, and there are no single men or women. I really want to repeat that sentence. No one who was not married is included in the memorial book. And this is just, there are many people who are not married. If you look through the communal records, the tax records, um, different payment records, the burial records, there are many men and women who did not get married in this time period. And they're just not included in the memoir book because marital status is something that is so critical in early modern Europe, whether it's connected to economics, which it is, or to communal honors and communal service and communal offices. And so if you're not married, you might be super important. You might have lived in the community for 80 years. And there are people in the memorable who are 90 years old, 80 years old. Um, and, and that usually is recorded because that's considered a very old age in this time period. And if you're single, you're just not included in the memorable. It's as if you're not part of the community. The other thing is no one without official communal membership is included. And that might sound like, okay, well, they weren't part of the community. But many, many residents of these communities don't have official communal membership. Communal membership is something that you can inherit. It's something that sometimes you can acquire, but especially in Germany, and my examples from tonight are from Germany, and especially in ghettos, and my examples are from ghettos, these are communities where it's very difficult to acquire communal membership because there's a limited amount of physical space. And so you can't just move to a community and get official communal membership, which comes with rights, obligations to pay taxes, and rights. And one of those rights is really to be included in the memoir book. And so you have examples of, for example, uh, guards who are hired to keep people out from coming into the community, particularly the poor. They live in Frankfurt for over 30 years. This is their home. But they are not in the book. They don't make it into the book. And so it's very, very important, I think, to recognize that um, these sources are limited in what they can tell us. And there are people in the community, certain echelons of the society, whether it's singles, whether it's children, whether it's people who are residents, long-term or short-term, who died in the community, but did not have official rights, 
whose names will not be included. And so that's a very important data point uh, for historians who are using these sources to reconstruct the histories of community. So how do we, how do we walk away? How do we conclude all these different facts? I would say that the main takeaway is that Memor Bocher are very, very consciously constructed to create and craft a community's legacy. They begin with a legacy and heritage from medieval Ashkenaz, a long list of historical events and individuals with whom the community identifies. They see themselves as part of that tradition. And these books have much to tell us about shifting norms, about charity and communal fundraising and how that was done differently over time, about family and prestige, about genders, and about something that I didn't really get to talk about so much this evening, which is individuals, individual men and women and what they did in the community and how they were memorialized. These are really a very critical source for understanding both communal history and communal memory. And I really do hope that um, more scholars will come and work on additional memorbucher and look at these valuable sources and see what they have to tell us about really the ins and outs of daily life in Jewish communities in early modern Ashkenaz. Thank you very much. Well, that was uh, amazing. Thank you very much. Um, there are many questions. I'm going to have to um, not read them all. I apologize to those I will skip over. Um, the first question is uh, uh, regarding um, the, the women's charitable, charitable activity. Uh, do we have any other examples of which women's charitable activity is obscured in this period of time? Uh, thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, we do. We have several different examples of that. Um, one example comes from a very interesting manuscript in the Central Archives for the History of the Jewish People. And that is a logbook of charity given by the community of Altuna, Hamburg, to um, the land of Israel. And what we see there is also extremely interesting. Most of the donations there are recorded as having been made by the men in the family, the exception being widows and some wealthy women, most famously Glickel of Hamlin. Um, yet, when you look in the second half of the log book, and this is what's really interesting, there's a formal section in which there's a formal beautiful list. Think about the importance of record keeping. And there the names are all male. But the second half, which is where the charity collector wrote down how he collected the money, you see that a lot of times it's the women who are bringing the money. And so the donation is recorded as male. And yet the person bringing the actual funds is the wife or the daughter. And so women are actively involved. And we see this also in various um, communal um, takanot, decrees, which in the late 18th century try to push women out as official charity collectors for the community. Thank you very much for getting many, many compliments in the chat room. I'll be sure to send you the transcript uh, later on so you can no. read them, read them in person. Um, R. Coleman asked, is there a list of available member book? Where uh, are the books indexed? And then Paul also asked, is there a list of surviving mem member book? book okay. We don't have a, a formal list of member book to the best of my knowledge. Although you could certainly go on the National Library website or on Ktiv and do a search for member book and come up with many of them. Some have been published. So the one that's lost to us from Worms was actually published in the 19th century. Um, this is an important historical project that I think needs to happen. Um, there are many memorable her held by various libraries and archives. And I am sure that if we look harder, we will find more of them. But unfortunately, there is no list uh, right now. But almost every community, regardless of size, really had, and I'm talking about even small villages, I found some of their memorable her. Thank you. Uh, Lawrence had a very interesting question. Um, just how expensive was 10 golden in the gilden in the purchasing power? That is a really, really important question. Um, it's something that, of course, shifts over time. One of the things that really interested me is that the rate stays constant from the 16th to the 18th century, even though the what that could purchase changes um, so so drastically in the period, particularly after a fire or after a plague or after a city is burned down when the community is really destitute. And it's in those times that we also see someone paying even one golden or just sahma, just a little bit in order to be included. Um, in some communities in the 16th century, 
uh, a master journeyman, if we use example for, from, from the Christian world, might make 40 or 50 gold in a year. So it's a pretty hefty sum. Um, but again, I think this is where looking at the on the ground versus looking at what's written in the text really matters. And that's why I think so many people don't really pay the money or certainly don't pay it right away. And I'll just add one more, one more thought that I have about this question. If you think about the slide that I showed from Frankfurt, where you have a wife and a husband and a son and a daughter-in-law, someone down the line when they have enough money is paying for all of them to be remembered. I don't know if there's a group rate or not a group rate, but they are sometimes waiting until there's enough money in the family estate to pay for this kind of inscription, which is really interesting. And that's why it's so important to realize that these are not chronological units, but sometimes family units. And they may explain something about a family's purchasing power. Thank you very much. Um, Diana asked, why are some pages graphic, like the tree or a circle? So that, that actually is a colophon, that special page. That is where um, the scribe writes about the whole process of reconstructing the memoir book um, in the wake of the Frankfurt fire. Most of the pages will, will just include the entries. Some, as I showed, were more ornate, and these are usually for more well-off families that can afford to have a well-to-do scribe famous scribe, inscribe them into the memoir book. Again, showing how important it is that it's recorded because you can't just come into the synagogue and leaf through the memoir book. So the fact that it's important enough to a family to have it inscribed in a really ornate way tells us how important the act of inscription is to this community. Thank you. There are two questions that are uh, very much related. Um, Nomi asked, uh, have the names been transcribed to English? and indexed or digitized? If not, is there any plan to do this? Or how to organize such a plan? Um, no, I'll keep the other question for later, sorry. Okay, um, there's usually not an index to the memoir book. Um, there are some later memoir books that do have indexes, indices, I think in the 19th century, um, we have some, but the ones from this early period would not have an index. Now, um, I think that that um, this material should be digitized and searchable. And one day I hope to try to, to work with that. Now there are also, uh, I think, two digitized memorable that people can look at um, in the Steinem Institute, which um, is an important institute in Germany that works with tombstones, digitizing tombstones. And I believe that the memorable of Koblenz, and just right now I'm not remembering what other memorable is digitized on their website. I myself worked with these um, with Excel spreadsheets. And so maybe that's the start of a project that could be searchable, which could be very useful for future scholars and also for anybody interested in genealogy. Thank you. Uh, sorry for my mix up. The two questions that are connected are David asked, uh, was this practice used in other communities and when and why did it stop? Did these develop into use the Yizkor books? And Ekaterina asked, why did this tradition of compiling memory books develop only in Germany and not in other regions? Um, so I, I focus on German Jewish history. Um, so I presented material from the communities that I worked on. This is definitely something that we have in many other communities. Uh, these are Yisker books. The memory book is a Yisker book. And um, certainly you find these in many other communities farther east as well. I just work on the west. Um, you can find it in Prague, you can find it in the East. All communities really would have these books. When does the practice stop? Really sometimes the practice stops uh, when World War II comes because these communities and their records are, um, are, are destroyed or go into hiding. And, and um, each community's memoir book has its own story of how it was saved and how it was um, preserved, and I know much more about the German stories, but there are wonderful examples of, of there's, I think, the Halberstadt memoir book, which goes really up till um, World War II, and then somebody saved it and brought it to the Central Archives and inscribed himself as the last person in that memoir book. So these are really hundreds of years of histories of community, and I know much more, as I said, about the German ones. Why does it start in this period? We don't know enough to know if there were other medieval memoir books or just the Nuremberg memoir book and when the genre really began. But what I see in earnest is really the 16th century, and I would tie it to the development of 
record keeping. This is the period of record keeping, of pinkasim, of log books, and not just for Jews, also for Christians, archiving. These practices begin in the 16th century, and I really see this as part and parcel of that trend. Thank you very much. I do want to read a few of the compliments. Keila wrote, thank you for this amazing presentation, informative and eye-opening, riveting. And then Sippy said, fascinating, such an important addition to our knowledge of Jewish history. Thank you so much. Um, there's, mm -hmm. There are another two questions that are related. Um, Nomi asked, if a wife survived her husband, would she not be the legal heir? And Sandra asked, are widowed and divorced women regarded as single? What about married couples with no children? Okay, these are excellent questions. Married couples with no children are included. Widow women and divorced women are included to the best of my knowledge. It's harder to track a divorcee because women are going to be referred to by the names of their fathers. So you have to have a tremendous amount of parallel sources in order to really work out who these people are. But widows are absolutely recorded. And my assumption would be that a divorcee would be um, included as well, although this would require a lot of research that may really only be possible in communities for which we have lists of divorcees, which we actually have for Frankfurt and Altona. Now, I forgot, uh, Jerome, I'm sorry, the first half of the question because I answered the second half. Oh, yes. Um, uh, if a wife survived her husband, would right. she not be the legal heir? If a wife survived her husband, she would not be the legal heir. The children would be the legal heirs, the male children. Now, there are different workarounds. You have some men who leave their wives control or write wills that give their wives certain property rights, especially in the 18th century. But legally, the children, especially the male children, are the heirs, and they're the ones who would have been responsible for the memorable countries. Thank you. Um, Jean asks, uh, please put information about the digitized member Bukhar in the chat. Uh, I, don't know if you can. Um, I don't know if you mean the, the, ser the searchable ones, but anyone is welcome to email me. I'm a professor of Bar Ilan University and you can Google that and I'd be happy to send you links. Also, of course, these manuscripts have been digitized um, and so you can peruse the manuscripts through Ktiv and other websites. Thank you very much. Um, a few people asked uh, similar questions regarding, well, it was Nomi and Dorna and a few others. How did these books survive the Shoah? Each, each community has its own story. Um, sometimes an individual might have taken the book and put it for safekeeping. Sometimes an entire community's archive was saved. Sometimes the community's archive was seized by the Nazis and then archivists come and slowly um, bring it back. So in, in Worms, for example, the communal archive, just to give a different example, not the Worms memorable story I don't know, but um, the, the famous Worms Machser was seized by the Nazis with the communal archive, and then the municipal archivist rescued those documents, slowly smuggling them into the cathedral, which was not bombed, and therefore we have much of the Worms archives. So. I think um, each community has its own story to tell about the how the volumes um, survived, and I think that's a that's an important history in and of in and of itself. Thank you so so much. Um, I do have to apologize once again to the people who I'm not reading their questions. Um, it's already kind of late, but um, I will open the microphone so that people can thank you. And if anyone has another question to ask, uh, you're most welcome to ask it. Thank you again, Professor uh, Deborah Kaplan. Um, thank you. And the microphones are now open. Everyone can. Uh, thank you. Okay. Sandra, so much. Um, thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was very informative. Very informative. Thank you. And well presented. Amazing talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Have a good evening or afternoon or morning. Laila <laughs> Tov. Laila Tov. Once again, I'd like to thank everyone from around the world for coming and, uh, and uh, listening to us and watching us. And uh, please join us in our next events, and we'll be happy to see you. Thank you, Professor Kaplan. Thank you. It was really, thank you all for coming and for listening. It's really such a pleasure. It was wonderful. Thank you. Wow.